Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Frostbite's Gaming Experience, part 10 of the Pokemon Blue walkthrough. So we now have Cut, and we've also got ourselves Flash, so because of that, we are able to finally make our way into the Dark Cave. However, we got to first get to the Dark Cave, and we've got a whole slew of trainers that are going to be blocking our way. A couple of annoying ones, too. In fact, I think this first one is actually probably the most annoying due to... One of the most obnoxious little things that can happen in the Generation 1 game. Moves like Wrap, Fire, Spin, those ones that are a continuous attack that you cannot escape out of. Um, get into a very unfortunate situation where I get paralyzed by an Oddish ahead of time. And then of course, stupid me, up next comes a Bellsprout. And of course, it's like, oh, you know, I should be able to, you know, he probably doesn't have the Wrap. And, even then, he'll probably miss it, but no, of course not. This Bellsprout gets about a good 100% chance of hitting it, no matter what. And, of course, I just keep trying to bait out the one chance that it would miss instead of just completely switching out, which then leads to more annoyance and just, yeah. Nothing quite as annoying as getting hit with a paralysis against a Bellsprout or anything that has one of these continuous attacks. One of those that I'm glad they finally... Well, I mean, I should say finally... Um, as you guys can tell, probably also in the sound of my voice, a little bit out of it, a little bit tired, but this kind of stuff's got to get done. You know, I'm falling, I'm falling behind enough as it is due to the whole entirety of May, and so I'm trying to get myself severely caught up here, uh, even though I'm a little bit out of sorts. But yeah, um, after Gen 1, you know, got rid of the whole entire continuous attack thing that essentially traps you and you're not able to, you know, attack or do really anything out of it, you know, they found, you know, they got rid of that after Gen 1, and thank God for that, there's a lot of things that they did in Gen 1 that just made absolutely no sense, like the, what is it, one in every 270 some odd number chance of actually missing an attack, even if it was 100% chance to hit it, just no sense whatsoever, um, if there's anything that there is to know about me, and when it comes to any kind of type of RPG game, or, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one out there that feels this way, but, you know, nothing hurts more than just missing an attack because you're doing no damage, you're essentially, it's just, it's essentially a waste of a move, and in certain situations, like, missing one move is essentially the difference between winning and losing whatever battle it is that you're doing. Hence why I usually don't go out of my way to get moves like, Blizzard, Thunder, and Fire Blast, because the lower percentage chance of them actually hitting, to me, is not really worth the reward that you get out of it in the amount of damage that it does. I just prefer to have, you know, a decently powerful attack like Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, and Flamethrower that does less damage, but it's still on the high-end spectrum of how much damage that it does, but it's a guaranteed chance to hit. Again, unless it's Gen 1, in which case... There's always that, you know, 2%, it's more than, I think it's like 0.8 something, I don't even know. I shouldn't be throwing out numbers if I don't know the actual number, but anyways, whatever small percentage chance it is for it to hit, you know, if it's not doing that, then it's no big deal. But speaking of percentage chances, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we got here. So we're on route number 9, and we've got ourselves in the red and blue version of the game as my deal kind of wigs out of me. There we go. Alrighty. 45% chance to catch yourself a Rattata, 30% chance to catch yourself a Sparrow, and in the red version, you have a 25% chance of catching an Ekans, and blue version, it's a 25% chance to catch a Sandshrew. In the yellow version, 15% chance to catch a Rattata, 4% chance it's a Raticate, 10% chance Sparrow, 1% chance it's a Pharaoh, 35% chance it's a Nidoran female, 25% chance it's a Nidoran male, and then 5% chance it's either a Nidorina or a Nidorino. Anyway, so there, there you go, you know, little grass patch areas up there. Um, nothing too much out of what the norm of what we're used to getting, really probably being able to get the 1% chance of getting a Pharaoh is in the yellow version only. Probably the one little big spike there, but again, even in Gen 1, and again, just a me thing personally, Pharaoh just never really seemed all that intimidating. And I know that's kind of a really stupid way to look at Pokemon, it's like, oh, based on how they look is going to tell me how powerful that they are, because in that case, you know, uh, the Dragonite would be like the weakest thing the game's ever seen because it's just one giant fat dinosaur dragon. And in Gen 1, it's actually one of the strongest 
Pokemon in the game. You know, it's a pseudo legendary, so you know you can't you can't just base it on looks. And unfortunately, as I grew up as a kid, that's kind of how I based everything off of, which is really weird because that also meant that. I thought Pidgeotto and Pidgeot were the coolest looking Pokemon in the entire game, which is why they're the, you know, Pidgeot was the first Pokemon I ever got to level 100, and why essentially the first time I played Pokemon Gold, the only Pokemon I used was Pidgeot, which, as you can imagine, made the game extremely difficult for me. Like, I mean, the amount of gym leaders that I would get stuck on because they could counter my Pidgeotto or Pidgeot and I was just too stupid to know how the game actually worked. Made it a lot har harder, that's for sure. Um, my first time beating Lance was one of the greatest accomplishments for me because again, I did it with like not even just him, the entirety of the Elite Four. I, I did it with just Pidgeot. That was about it. I remember I had my starter in the daycare center for whatever reason. I had a, a Graveler, I guess, but he was severely underleveled because if I'm not giving experience to Pidgeot, it's not worth giving experience to anybody, I guess. That's kind of how my mind worked as a kid. So yeah, you know, just imagine what 12-year-old Will playing, you know, Gen 2 for the first time. Also, here comes the editing fail. like do not recall running into a wild Pokemon, but hey, there we go. You're going to see exactly how I do these. I just leave. Call it good. That's literally it. All just to get an ether that I don't use anyways, because generally, usually pretty good on the selective amount of moves that I have with my Pokemon, so I never really ever need to use one. And I generally end up saving them just in case if I ever needed to in the Elite Four, but I don't believe I actually did in this run. Again, it's been about a month or two since I played and beat this game for the channel. It's just a matter of doing all the post-commentary right now. So, I know I said it before, but just to reiterate for those of you, again, I it, it's been months since I played this to, to do this walkthrough. So it's just gonna be as much like news to me as it is to you guys on half of the stupid stuff I even do with this game probably half the time. Uh, it's amazing. But anyway, so, um, so once we get to, towards the end of route number nine, we head on downward towards route 10, which does have a differences in the amount of Pokemon that you can run into in the grass area, because there's just one speck of grass, well, I mean, a giant area of grass before you go down to the cave itself. And actually, it was surprising when I saw actually the amount of Pokemon that you could actually catch by going to this patch of grass. So, looking at red and blue here, you have a 30% chance of running into a Sparrow and a 45% chance you're gonna run into a Voltorb, which is something I actually did not know. And in the red version, 25% chances in Ekans with a 25% chance a Sandshrew in the blue version. And in the yellow versions, you have a 15% chance for a Rattata, 5% chance for a Raticate, 10% uh, chance for a Nidoran female or a Nidoran male, and then Machop, 5% chance, and a Magnemite, 55% chance of catching. So you're looking towards being able to actually get an electric type Pokemon in the yellow versions pretty much right after you go against the electric gym leader himself. And a lot of this is supposed to be about the fact that the power plant is further south of Route 10. We just don't have a means to get to it yet because we have not learned surf as of yet. But we've also got some water, so of course, old rod fishing, Magikarp, nothing else. That's all you're going to get. Uh, if you get yourself a good rod, there's a 50% chance it's going to be a Poliwag, and a 50% chance it's going to be a Gold Dean. Get yourself a Super Rod in the red and blue version, 50% chance it's a Poliwhirl, with a 50% chance it's a Slowpoke, and in the yellow versions, the Super Rod, 70% chance it's a Krabby, 10% chance it's a Kingler, and a 20% chance that it is a Horsey. So there you go, there's all the stats that you're going to be getting out of this video, and, you know, there's going to be quite a slew of stats we're going to have to go through when it comes to the Dark Cave because, again, uh, once you get to the multiple levels, you have different percentage chances of what Pokemon you run into. But then there's also another very interesting thing about the Dark Cave that Intel, you know, once again, 
playing this for the walkthrough, I was entirely unaware of, and it's, it's a little bit interesting because it makes kind of the design of the Dark Cave not really make much sense. We'll get more into that once we get into the next part, you know, even though this part is nothing but going against continuous trainers and, you know, once again, that was kind of the biggest thing that really, like, I don't know. I know, like, trainer, uh, trainer fighting, you know, training this way is, like, one of the best ways to do it. But Gen 1, especially later down on the line, there are just some parts where it's, like, it's just such a long stretch of trainers that it really feels like it's, like, they're, they're just... There's got to be something else that we could be doing, you know, but there just isn't. You know, it's literally just this, and it kind of does get old after a while, especially much further on down the line. And uh, honestly, in cases like that, it's like, you know, I find myself sitting here and it's like, what am I going to talk about? You know, I, I pretty much said a lot of my piece of Pokemon. Everyone that wants to know how I feel about Pokemon can check out my Gen 2 walkthrough or just kind of get a small idea with this one. You know, again, Gen 1 is not the one that I grew up with, so I don't have as many memories with it as I did with Gen 2. I've even got some memories of Gen 3, not a whole lot, but some. But again, Gen 1, I just kind of stayed away from and, you know, things like this is kind of why, you know, the story is just so bland. Again, it's the very first one that came out. You can't fault it for it. But again, when you go back to play it, you know, it's it gets really, really noticeable, especially when, it, when I'm sitting here before doing my recording. And the first thing that pops into my mind is, dear God, I've got about 15 minutes to kill with this part of nothing but trainer fights. And I have no idea what it is I'm going to talk about. Because it's like, yeah, it's Pokemon. Like, everyone kind of knows what, you know, what you're going to get out of it. People kind of already know what my experience with it is. Because, again, Gen 2 is just kind of really all I played. And then the Gen 2 remake uh, in Gen 4. Which, that, I will especially... I'll probably be doing that one live, too. I think Gen 4 in its, like, entirety, I'm probably just going to end up uh, playing live. Because... Post commentaries are rather difficult to do um, if you don't like if it feels like you've already said everything you need to say about it within the first couple of parts, and the rest is just like okay, so we're repeating what we've already done. Um, Gen three might be a little bit different because there's more uh, there's like a bigger story with it, I guess. So you know, there's a little bit more that can be said. But I think like Gen 4 onward, I'm going to have to do live just to try and keep it a little bit more entertaining. I guess I'm not fully sure. But anyway, so about ready to go into the dark cave. I think we got one more trainer fight that we got to do. But even then before then on the side of this, I believe is another elixir or a max elixir. I know there's something hidden here, but uh, super potion. Okay. Uh, wasn't even at all what I thought. I thought there was something on the side of the building, but no, there isn't. Okay, cool. Um... Also, one very interesting thing, after you do a trainer battle, whatever trees that you've taken out, magically regrow. I don't really know how exactly that works. In fact, I really wish that was kind of something that Pokemon just kind of did in general. It's like, you've kind of already proven that you've learned the move Cut. And I go into like a little bit more detail about this in my eight things that I want in Pokemon video that I keep bringing up, but I, I and I should probably go back and rewatch it and probably like do a follow up video on that because you know as times change, there's like differences in the way like I that a I think, but then also be like other things I'd much rather have or some things I'm like yeah I would like this but it's not nearly as big all that stuff but. I think at some point it would be really nice that, you know, once you've proven that you have the HM cut, once you chop down a tree, let it just stay down. Why do I have to keep chopping down the same tree over and over and over again whenever I come back? Now, again, I haven't played since Gen 5, so I don't know what X, Y, Sun, Moon, and then obviously whenever the Switch comes out, well, not the Switch, but the Switch Pokemon game, the Switch has been out for a while now already. Um, whenever it comes out, but again, I don't know if that's something that they've already done or not. I'm not hundred percent sure, but, um, you know, that'd just be something nice to have. But anyways, that's going to do it for part 10, ladies and gentlemen, this part sucked. I'm not going to lie, <laughs> but again, you know, when, when you fight a whole bunch of trainers, what can you do? But we got the dark cave next. That's a little bit more interesting to go into. So I'll get you guys on the next part. Then we'll see you guys then.